Uh, g'day, folks. Welcome to another edition of the Detour Live. Normally, I'm joined by four-time National Road Champion John Trevorrow, but he's actually doing some work for the first time in about six months. So he's on a Zoom call, and I've got a new and improved version of Viffy, a bit skinnier, a bit more knowledge, a little bit more polished and doesn't cough and splatter before every answer. Uh, it's Matthew Keenan, and your audio, uh, let's have a listen. We've got an audio problem. Can you hear us? Uh, are you there, Keaton? Uh, hang on. This is a great start. I'm just going to do an audio test. Um, I can't actually hear your audio. Um, this is a this is a sensational start. Unmute mic. Let's have a go again at your mic. Jeez, Keaton, I gave you a big pump up. And uh, your audio doesn't seem to be working. This is a sensational start. Um, unmute mic. It says, can't unmute your guest. Their mic isn't connected. So maybe try unplug your cables and then plug them in again. Um, I'm just going to try and fill dead air <laughs> as we try and get these audio issues sorted. Um, you there, Keenan? No, still nothing, mate. Uh, this is hilarious. Um, you know what I'll try, Ken? I'll kick you off, click the link again, and let's start again. Uh, and I'll just fill the dead air while we get this sorted. Hang on. Uh, Keenan's gone. I'll kick him from the studio. Jeez, this is a first for the detour. Well, overnight, uh, Primoz Roglic, as we tipped, uh, won a stage of the Vuelta stage number eight. And he's only about 16 seconds off Carapaz in the overall standings now. Uh, and we predicted that, as Sam Bewley predicted the stage before uh, Michael Woods. So we're two from two. And we've got a pretty big show as well. We're going to have Simon Gerrans on later, and he's going to talk about uh, what his next chapter looks like. I want to ask him about things like the service course. So uh, this is a project that he's working with uh, Christian Meyer, uh, when I was in Drona, the service course was only newly established and um, it's basically to, to give people the experience of, uh, as a pro, they have uh, like service courses for all the teams and they want to give that experience to locals and you can literally go over on a holiday, you don't even have to take a bike uh, and you can go and they'll they'll sort you out, they'll give you a bike to ride on, you can get a massage, um, you know, the facilities there are unbelievable and you can go for rides with guys like Christian and, and Gero. Um, it's a fantastic initiative. Now, Keenan's trying to reconnect as we speak and we will have John Trevorrow on in about uh, 10 minutes' time. Um, but it looks like we're, we're having trouble getting Keenan back into the system. It says says, uh, device not connected. Uh, this is probably one of the biggest clusters we've ever had to start off the detour. If anyone's got any comments, um, pump them through. Uh, we might even have to, uh, when I upload this as an audio file, I might even have to do some trimming because uh, this is this is not great podcasting at the moment. Uh, Keenan, your device is not connected. What I might do is I'll throw to a quick word from our mates at Bike Exchange. And that way, I can uh, sort out the technical difficulties behind the seats. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at. This guy, this girl, them, all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike. Or just a piece of it. Amateurs. Semi amateurs. And pro amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank and these bars. This could be the perfect match. But not this one. This girl has a bike to sell, and thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers, yours, and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving. We are the world's number one bike marketplace with over 500,000 products and 900 brands where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike. 
bike exchange where the world buys, sells, learns and rides. Still no Matty Keenan. Uh, we're working on that, uh, but we'll soldier on because Johnny Javaro uh, is going to be on later on as well. A um, couple of things I want to talk to about Keenan uh, with Keenan was uh, a few of the breaking news stories uh, over the last couple of days. One of the ones was from my old mate, Mauro Vegni. Uh, he's wanting punishment for Jumbo Visma and EF Pro Cycling after their actions uh, during the Giro. Uh, now, most people know my opinions of uh, the boss of the Giro at the moment. I'm not I'm not his biggest fan. Uh, hang on. We, we might have Keenan. Please work. Yes, I can hear audio. Oh, mate. I'll tell oh, so, you. So I don't know what went wrong. I've got no See, idea. So I've reverted I, to the phone. Yeah, perfect. I don't I don't know how in commentary you can do it where you're used to working, say, with McEwen, but say McEwen mm. drops out or there was that day that he was late in the commentary box, yeah. how you feel solo for, for such a long period of time. Do you want my favourite one with Robbie? It was yep. on the stage. It was in a famous wine growing area and Robbie had to do a corporate ride. So he said that he'd arrive around about an hour after I'd actually started commentating. So I knew that he was going to be late. I figured Robbie says an hour, I'll give that an hour and a half. So then we're commentating, or I'm commentating, not we, I'm commentating, nothing is happening. I mean, nothing. It's pancake flat, two rider breakaway. They're going along at about 36 Ks per hour. I mean, I could have kept up. Hour goes by, I know Robbie's going to be running late. I look at the weather conditions. It's a block headwind. So the corporate ride is running late. Robbie gets across the finish line with his corporate ride. This is out of his control about an hour and 40 or so, an hour 45 after the race has started. So I've been going an extra 45 minutes over what I'd anticipated. I thought, okay, he'll be here soon. Another half an hour almost goes past. No, Robbie. He comes in and he smells like he's ready to take me out for dinner. He's had a shower. He's got the aftershave Oh, on. yeah. And no he comes rust. in. Dan, he comes in with not a snack, not a sandwich. He comes in with a platter. He sits down next to me in commentary with this big platter of food and he passes me across a note. Sorry, mate. Hunger flat. Sits next to me for the next 15 minutes and keeps eating. Mate, how did you not lose it? Like, oh, I would have lost the plot. I did afterwards. Oh, fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, I, I traveled up I, with him. I traveled with Robbie um, in 2012 when we were doing the backstage passes with Green Edge. And um, oh, it was hilarious. Like, some of it, it's, it was just hard to lock him down to yeah. a set routine. Like, he's a man that likes making decisions on, on you know, the seat of his pants. Just Which is actually good minute. for, yeah. yeah, but that's good for me. You know what I'm like. You, know, you mm. and I have done a few things together. And, you know, I'm a little bit over-organized in some respects. You know, I'm the kind of guy who plan, plans to be spontaneous. You know, yeah. <laughs> just spending, spending, yeah. time with, spending time with Robbie is actually good for me. It helps me relax. But there, one of the biggest challenges I had in commentary was I was commentating the Vuelta solo as I did do, you know, start to finish for stages for the first, I think, six or seven years or maybe even seven or eight years that I covered it. So the first year that I did it was 2008 and there was a stage in Andorra and it was biblical rain. I mean, this was Noah's Ark material. And for the last 60 kilometres, we had no pictures. We just oh. had images of the fixed cameras at the finish line. And they rolled in a couple of highlights of the sign-on, image of the finish line. Sign-on, image of the finish line. And the internet coverage was poor, so I wasn't getting as many updates as to what was happening, who was in the breakaway, etc. I ran my own podcast for 60 kilometres, basically. And then the riders came around the corner with around about 250 metres to go. And that was the first I knew as to who was leading. And Alessandro Balan won the stage. I remember it vividly like it was yesterday. Jeez, if you can get through that, then when it does all work, it must feel like a piece of cake. Yeah, I'll give you another one. Here's a good one. This mm -hmm. is another one on the Vuelta. The Vuelta is always a good one for stories. They were doing a circuit around a mountain. And I was traveling with one of the guys that was organizing the broadcast, Jorge, fantastic guy, great guy to travel with. And they'd made a change to the time that they were going to do the broadcast. And I wasn't aware of that. So we were having a bite to eat before going to the finish line, which was just at the top of the hill. And the, the pelotons coming, the breakaway comes past us and Jorge says, I feel like I'm forgetting something. I've told, I've told TVE 
I told the Dutch, I told the Belgians, the French no. Oh, Matthew, we're starting the broadcast early. We're on in about 20 minutes. Oh, no. And the commentary position is 10 k's up the road. Or it's, he said, we're starting in 30 minutes. The commentary position is 10 k's up the road. So we had to wait for the breaker to go past, the peloton to go past, and then the groupetto goes past, and Paul Martins riding for Rabo Bank was at the back of the group. So we're sitting behind Paul Martins now in the car, and the clock is ticking down. I walked into the commentary box as the one-minute ticker had started counting down. I got into the box with 57 seconds to spare and then put the headphones on before I then started getting, you know, all my paperwork and so on out of the bag before I started commentating. So what's the contingency plan? Say you couldn't make it and you couldn't get into the box, what would they do? No, I don't know. I don't, they didn't have one because <laughs> they didn't anticipate me eating lunch on the side of the no. road. And they thought that I was in safe hands because I was travel I was traveling with the guy organizing the broadcast employed <laughs> yeah, by the right. race organizer. So you would have thought I was in good hands. I'll give you one yeah. more. So the highlights package from the Vuelta, after each stage, you go into another truck and you do a 26-minute highlights package. And it goes out as live. But it chops and changes around a little bit. And there was one stage I remember vividly. I'm about 10 minutes into it. And then the screen goes blue and it says no signal. But I can hear that the broadcast is still going out. So I hit the button to talk back to the producer. Matthew in International, no pictures, no signal, no pictures. Keep talking, generic, just talking generic. Who's in the leader's yep. jersey? Who was in the breakaway earlier? Matthew in International, no pictures, nothing. No response from back in the truck. So then I another couple of words. I pull out my phone and I dial Jorge's number again, the same guy, and then... Hit mute, Jorge, Matthew, no pictures, no signal. Start talking again, still blue screen. The door opens up into the commentary box. It's Jorge. He looks in, he goes, oh, Matthew, no pictures. So they've gone around the back of the truck. They've had to plug some cables back in. The guys doing the operations on the truck, they were packing up, ready to go home. They just pulled the wrong cable out. Oh, no. So the that... cable for my images was pulled out whilst the signal was still going out on the satellite <laughs> and I was commentating on a blue screen. Mate, that's a, that's a thing that always baffles me is there's so many cables in this media area um, yeah. and they all have to go in the right spots. You you stuff up one cable, the whole thing can go boom. Yeah, exactly. I walk past them and I was like, I'm not touching it. I'm if not he... going anywhere near it. You missed all the drama. We had drama at the start of the show. Uh, Keenan's audio wasn't working. And then it was my I fault, to John. Dribble <laughs> for five <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad I missed now, that. I'm glad I missed it because I would have been blamed. So that's yeah, good. It was yeah. your fault because you weren't here. <laughs> now, one thing I was talking about before you came on, Keenan, is my mate, the director of the Giro, he's fired me up again because he's come out and said that there needs to be some form of punishment for Jumbo Visma and EF Pro Cycling after their actions during the Giro. Um, unbelievable. Punishment? Unbelievable. Is, he, that is an own goal. That is an absolute own goal. So he wants to punish Jumbo Visma for putting the safety and the health of their riders and the health of the entire community, the global community, ahead of his bike race. That's yep. what he's saying. It's ridiculous. What do you reckon, statement. John? Joe Pesci. Yeah, Joe Pesci. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I'm not his biggest fan uh, and, and his attitude right at the start. Look, I love the Giro. As you guys know, I've said often enough, I've ridden that. I, I, I've been to 20-something tours to France, and I don't know how many, maybe eight Giros, but I, I absolutely am in love with the race. It's something about it, the passion of the fans. It's it's the bike rider's race, you know, and 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 you feel it when you're there, as you were, were, well know, Matty. But I've never been in love with the organisation. They're a bit – okay, it's a, it's a tell. It'll be right, mate. It'll be right, mate. But what I don't like about that – his organisation is his bully boy tactics he's going on with. Mm. The fact that they, in this time uh, 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 scenario, that they can think that it's all right to put pro teams in a bus for an hour and a half, then race them 250 kilometres and then put them in a bus for an hour and a half after that and think it's not going to come back and bite them. And that's what happened. Mm. People say, oh, why didn't they complain at the start of the Giro? They knew that was going to happen. Well, you know, 
to three weeks, two and a half weeks into a grand tour, and everyone's getting tired. The weather's turned nasty. They've been battling this whole, you know, thing with the COVID, and then suddenly they're getting no, you know, no rest in buses, and it just was the straw that broke the camel's back, and they cracked. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And there was a few days where the guys in the group Petto, they had more hours on the bike when you factor in the neutral zone and then right in from the stage finish back to the team bus because there wasn't space at the finish line for team buses. They had more time on the bike than was, a, you know, they were able to actually get time in bed, sleeping, resting and recovering. <laughs> and, John, in terms of your comments about the race organisation, well, we're just talking about the Tour of Spain and some of the challenges that I've had there. What I love about the Vuelta, yeah, they make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I make plenty of them. So do all of us. Human beings make mistakes. The thing I love about them in Spain at the Vuelta, when they make mistakes, they go, mistake, sorry, let's try and fix it next time. Mm. Yeah, that's not in Vigny's uh, uh, um, bad DNA. Tricks at all. It's not in his DNA, no. Uh, uh, and, no, he's definitely the, the, the bully boy. And this will bring, bring him unstuck. The, who, what was the name of the guy who was doing it before Vigny? He actually – Aquaroni, Michele Aquaroni. Yeah. He actually had a fantastic attitude. And he was prepared to talk with people, mm. and uh, yep. uh, it's all he got set up. When he, he got set up. They they yeah. threw him under the bus, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, but anyway, they definitely I don't, did. Yeah. I don't want to be sued, so that's allegedly he was set up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, in other good, good <laughs> yeah, in other good news, though, uh, I saw another article, Keenan, about EF offering one year uh, extensions to riders who took a pay cut during yeah, COVID. That's good. On the flip side, you know, that's how you should treat people and, and the riders because yeah. it has been a stressful period. And we were talking the other night, uh, you know, there's upwards of 100 riders that are out of contract. Mm -hmm. You look at uh, a good mate of mine, Jay McCarthy, uh, he had that crash uh, at the Vuelta. It turns out he scans, there's no fractures of his kneecap or whatever. But um, that's a guy that would be super stressed at this point, yeah. particularly around contract time. So Absolutely. Um, well, he's without a contract. He crashed at Liège, best on Liège as well. And I saw you had Luke Roberts on last night. I recorded a podcast as well with Luke Roberts at Team Sunweb. He's one of the most interesting, intelligent bike riding people you can possibly have a chat oh, with. Oh, yeah. And we've got Rob Power on their team. He doesn't have a contract for next year either. And they're not sure whether they're going to re-sign Rob or not. Rob's still only 25 years of age, I think. But, you know, it's a buyer's market at the moment. We've got a yeah. guy like Ben Dybul across at NTT. He gets his first opportunity this year in the World Tour. The team's folded in at the end of the season and he's had no opportunities to show himself and that could spell the end of his career at this level. It's a tough market for people without a contract for next year. One of the guys in the last two days who said there is 100 uh, current pros, World Tour pros, who haven't got a contract for next year. Mm. 100. That's, that's yeah. pretty uh, amazing. You did mention uh, that, uh, Luke Roberts being uh, you know so professional and so switched on. We interviewed him, as we said, yes, you haven't listened to it yet, but I did have a go at him. I don't know how professional he is because he actually uh, let his wife travel with me on the detour, on the Tour de France one year. We all make mistakes, John. <laughs> John. we all make mistakes. So when I first started racing, John, he was he and his family they'd moved to melbourne and they were members of the brunswick club because his dad was a frame builder at hillman cycles and when i first started racing thursday nights at northcote and i had no background in cycling whatsoever and our club president northcote said if you want to learn how to race watch that guy and it was the oldest guy racing a grade then and it was wayne roberts it was luke's dad and he was an absolute joy to watch you know, there was young guys, there was guys in, you know, just starting with the VIS, AIS type level guys. And Wayne, he looked like he was on the rollers the whole time. He was so smooth, the right position. And that was Luke's dad. And he was fantastic to watch. Well, he, of, he, ran, he ran second in the Sun Tour. Yeah, to, so did Luke. To, uh, Peter Vizanko, yeah. Uh, and he ran second to me in a, to a Tassie, in the first ever okay. Pro-Am pro -Am, uh, bike race in Australia. It was a, a 79 Tour Tassie. And I remember, this is a quick story, I'll whack it in now because it's perfect timing. Um, Luke won a Tour Tassie that I organised in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, I can't remember what year. And he won it with a final time trial at Launceston 
just beating Russell Van Hout, he's a South Australian mate, by you know, less than a second. It was mm. very interesting. And when I handed him the trophy, he said, this means something because I'm glad, glad to take this trophy off you that you took, took off my father back in 1979. Yeah. <laughs> and then Luke finished second in a Sun Tour as well, and I really wanted him to win it for that same reason because his dad yeah. had finished second in the Sun Tour. Yeah, yeah. Be because of Luke's um, personality, softly spoken, you know, he is a little bit more of an introvert. Do you think that he's one of the most understated Aussies in the world tour in terms of what he's doing currently? Mm -hmm. He really does fly under the radar. He doesn't really get the exposure Dan, that that Dan, he should. I don't, I don't think it. I know it. <laughs> let's look. Let's let's look at his CV as a sports director. You want to go through it with one of the yep. smallest budgets on the world tour. So here's the guy that was calling the shots when Michael Matthews won the green jersey at the tour. He was the guy calling the shots in that same tour when Warren Bargill won the King in the Mountains jersey. He was the guy calling the shots when Tom Dumoulin won the Giro d'Italia, finished second at the Giro, finished second at the tour, and challenged for the Volta de Spagna. He ended up finishing in fifth position. He was the guy this year calling the shots at the Giro when they got second and third with, again, one of the smallest budgets in the race. He was the one that set up their sprint lead-out train, and you saw them at the tour. They didn't win the stage with Case Ball. Well, Van Aert got the better of him, but that was the best lead-out train in the race. He is the most underrated sports mm. director or cycling personality in Australia right now. Jeez, we needed you for the intro. We just introduced <laughs> him. We go, hey, we've got Robbo here. Hey, Luke, how are you? How's it? <laughs> oh, mate, I've, I've got... Huge amount of respect for Luke Roberts. <laughs> I had to remind Dan that he, that he is an Olympic gold medalist and world champion. Oh, yeah, yeah Dan. <laughs> yeah, Dan, he's, he's, ridden, he's ridden the Tour de France twice. He rode it with CSC. He rode it with the Mill Ram team. And famously, he was in the breakaway on the day of Chaingate and he finished in fifth position on the stage in a Bannier de Luchon, which was won by Tom Avocler. Hey, speaking of a guy who's got a Rolodex of victories and achievements, Simon Gerrans joins us uh, live from Hotel Quarantine. How are you holding up, Gero? <laughs> yeah, holding up. Only a couple of days to go now. So, um, yeah, I think we're 12 days in um, and starting to climb up the walls. Oh, he's, got the, he's, got the chisel, he's got the chisel on the wall and he's counting the days down. He's just got two to go now. <laughs> This, yeah, mate, we, we, we are literally just getting you on the show to check in just to see how you're traveling and if you needed <laughs> an excuse to get away for half an hour in the corner of the room. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Shut the doors and put the family in one I, I was doing. <laughs> I was doing texts back and forth with, with, with Gero earlier uh, to, to get the timing right, and he's got on special uh, father duties today. But uh, he sent me through an absolutely sensational photo of his young daughter sucking on the uh, on the little bottle. Um, and I think I said it to you, Dan, you should put it up, but not if Gero doesn't allow it, but it was a most gorgeous photo. Uh, yeah, Simon, it must have been, must have been challenging with three kids, husband and wife, and a pregnant wife, confined yeah. to two hotel rooms for 14 days oh very much so yeah if there's if you think a grand tour is a is a test in resilience there's nothing on this well this is <laughs> this is the thing a lot of riders are saying they don't want to come out to australia because of the two weeks quarantine are you saying that this is justified just don't do it guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah no not if you have uh not if you want to recover from your season but i guess <laughs> it, it, it definitely uh if you're doing this on your own, it'd be a lonely, a lonely period. But uh, there's number of dull moment now, house. That's for sure. Yeah. It's the ultimate test of a marriage of strength. Yeah, you can say that. <laughs> well, the yeah. only bonus out there is two rooms. So that, I was glad to hear that. <laughs> I thought you might all yeah. be in one room. <laughs> At least no, it's two rooms. <laughs> no, they haven't shot five of us in one room. We're, we're actually pretty lucky with the hotel we've ended up in. So, yeah, there's a couple of couple of separate rooms and sort of a bit of a, a lounge area as well. So we're able to, to spread out a little bit. But, um, yeah, as you guys know, I have two very energetic kids and, and now a toddler who's on the move. Um, so, yeah, it's keeping us on our toes. That's <laughs> genetics coming back to bite. Have you been yeah. able to watch much of the racing? No, I haven't really watched any of the racing, you know, honestly. I, I, I check in first thing in the morning to, to look at the results. Um, but when we first come back, obviously we were fighting jet lag there for a little while. So even staying up past about 9 or 10 p.m. Um, was hard enough. So, yeah, unfortunately I haven't seen any of the, any of the racing on SBS, uh, with the exception of, um, yeah, Tour of Flanders. I watched a bit of that. But like when I raced Tour of Flanders, I sort of got dropped with about 60K to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking at the results sheet then between the Vuelta and then comparing it to the Giro and the Tour, what are the main differences that you see between them? 
Oh, the standout differences uh, to me between the results of the Vuelta and the other two sort of grand tours that we've uh, enjoyed so far this season is the age of the riders that are doing well. We saw such a young group of riders really dominating the Tour de France and the same at the at the Giudatea. But the Vuelta, it's the old boys that are they're coming to the to the fore and 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 really doing well. When you see the likes of you know Primoz Roglic, obviously doing great, um, as well as. Uh, as well as um, like Woods has won stage is is a gear race. So it's the guys with a few seasons in their legs now. And I think getting to the to the back end of this sort of short intense season, um, the guys with the with the years of experience are sort of uh, starting to really shine through. Hey, Gero, really, we've spoken. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, mate. Was, we've spoken a bit about on this show um, the back end of the season. A lot of guys out of contract. Did you ever go through periods where there was contract stuff playing on your mind? Does it affect? the way you race, particularly if you're a guy that doesn't have a contract for the following year and it's getting to that 11th hour? Yeah, it definitely does. And I think you see uh, guys will just throw caution to the wind in the in the back end of the season when they are without a contract. Uh, so the racing is quite often really aggressive in the, in the last part of the season. Um, so it does play on your mind uh, very much so because guys will li- literally be like, well, if I don't do something in this race, you know, I'm potentially dropping back uh, one level in, in teams or potentially without a job whatsoever. And I think with the market this year, there are so many riders without contract or with a couple of teams looking like folding. Um, the racing will be really aggressive and and uh, really exciting right to the end of the season. How does it impact on your decision making when you're racing? Let's take a guy like Rob Powell, for example, who's still really young. Uh, for memory, he's only 25 years of age. He's had some good results. He's second at the Tour de Avenir. He's finished top 10 at Strata Bianca but he has struggled with consistency. He doesn't have a contract yet for next year, and Sunweb are undecided on him. How does that impact on the way he races? Well, literally, he's in a position where he's got nothing to lose um, by, by going on the attack and trying to race really aggressively. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, and I don't think this will be the case with Rob, guys start to race a little bit selfishly when they're thinking about contracts, and often that's to their detriment because if they prove they're a team player right to the wire, I think that actually enhances their contract more so to stay with their current team than a result because I think a team is is very aware of the capabilities of a rider after being in the team for a couple of years. Um, but if they start to race selfishly, they'll put a nail in the coffin and they won't get another contract. I think one of the challenges right at this moment, uh, Gero, is that we were just talking just before you came on, there are 100 World Tour pros not signed for next year. And I think some teams that would have been ready to sign are just hanging off because they think, well, we might be able to get some like rider A or rider B. So they're just hanging off for a little bit before they sign um, uh, their guys. And so it's a really awkward situation. Yeah, that would be a very, very difficult situation to be in um, from a rider. And you can kind of understand the team managers. They're like, well, there's a whole bunch of great riders on the market if I held out a little bit longer, I'm potentially going to get this guy for, for half as much of, of what he's asking for now. So you can sort of see from a team manager's perspective why they would be holding out, but that that is definitely a team a, a, a team manager's market, not a rider's market at all. <laughs> hey. And then it's going to be really hard to be, with the seasons finishing so late, it's going to be really hard for sports directors, team managers to be planning 2021. Well, I think what, what will make it very difficult to plan 2021 is just the racing situation. Who knows where the, the restrictions are going to be around COVID and whatnot early season next year. Um, I'm not sure what the status is with Twitter and Under, but I think a lot of riders don't know when they're going to be starting their year. Mm. Um, I was going to say, Gero, you know how they talk in a lot of sports, particularly you know AFL, it, they're trying to drill into the athletes to have interests outside of the sport so that you do have a backup plan. How difficult is that with the life of a pro cyclist to have things that they're working on in the side? I know some of the female riders have got degrees and you know studied business courses and stuff like that, but how hard is it in the world to, to have that backup plan? Uh, it is very difficult to do something really structured. I think um, that's ongoing once you're racing at a at the world tour sort of level, but that doesn't mean you can't have interests outside the sport and interests that can develop you as a person and sort of increase your chances of having a career post racing. Um, there is ample time in the off season to to do a number of activities, um, build a network, associate with some people with from outside of the sport as well. That will able that will help you when you when you finish racing. So, in the season, it's quite difficult. Um, however, 
you know, post-season each year when you have a bit of downtime. I think there's ample time to do a number of things. Do you think it's more difficult for a non-European? Because if you're a 22-year-old young professional that's Belgian or French and you can still live at home and you've got that extra support at home, so there's some, some stuff that you'd, you're just not doing because your parents might be taking care of the dinner or the washing and so on and you can be near a local university to do a degree or something. Do you think it's more difficult for Australians, Americans, South Africans, etc.? I definitely think it would be a lot easier if you were if you were in a an environment where you had other people around you taking care of all the things that um, so the other bits and pieces, like you said, if you if you're still living at home, for example, when you're still racing professional and you had some time on your hands um, or more time in your hands than what maybe a foreigner would, I think that would definitely definitely um, help. That a guy that I remember that I raced alongside for for a number of years or against for a number of years was Manuel uh, Quinziato. And he completed a law degree throughout his racing career. Um, mm. And I think he was able to do that because he was largely based in his home area in Italy. Mm. Yeah. Well, Adam Adam Hansen's another one, Kino. He does a lot of stuff off the bike. Um, I heard stories he was at Grand Tours on his laptops and trading stocks and doing all these things <laughs> in his amazing. room. Yeah, and he's also uh, in his like, somnia. Yeah, Adam Hansen. If you hear he here, he only sleeps about three or four hours a night, even in the Grand Tour. Really? I'm looking forward to seeing him in, in action in Ironman events. And I reckon mm. Cameron Worth is going to be really nervous about his bike leg record at Hawaii. Yeah, yeah for sure. Mm. Um, do, you, do you think, do you think, Gero, that that's something that cycling should probably dial up a little bit more, preparing riders for the transition post-cycling? Or is it one of those things where it's like, well, you need to sort of sort your own stuff out? Oh, I think largely you've got to be responsible for your, for your own stuff when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, I kind of feel most World Tour teams, they're at their absolute limit supporting riders to, to so they can perform the best of their ability in racing, um, let alone thinking too much about what these guys are going to do when they're out of the system. So I kind of feel like it's larger the riders' responsibility. And the guys that sort of leave the sport and say, oh, you know, I've just been left on my own, I think that's larger because they didn't take responsibility for them, themselves throughout their career. Mm. What do you reckon, John? <laughs> Nah, just throw it out there and they'll be right, you know. But as Gero just said, the teams are having enough trouble just, you know, getting through the season and getting the racing mm. going. There's no way that they're going to be looking at uh, uh, other opportunities for riders. That's definitely up to the riders themselves to try and get themselves sorted. But as you guys just said, it's a lot harder when you're like Australians, Americans, whatever, when you're away from home. When you've grown up in a town, you might be racing, you're going home at night, you're still seeing your old friends, the people you went to school with, all those connections are there easily easy for you to jump into uh, mm. some other uh, uh, aspect uh, uh, of life and jump on. But when you go over from Australia and you sit yourself in Europe and you're trying to make it and you turn to the, uh, become a pro, you're flat out just surviving with that. You're not really – haven't got the opportunity to really do much else. Although people like Gero, you've managed to do it pretty well. Yeah, exactly. And, Dan, I think Simon nailed it when he said you've got to take responsibility for yourself. You can't get mm. spoon-fed. You've got to do it of your own accord because if you just keep getting shoveled everything, it's, you know, the old theory of I can, you know, give you fish and you'll be fed for a day or I can teach you how to fish and you'll take care of yourself for life. You've, you've got to go out and learn how to fish for yourself. You're a wise man, Kino. Oh, like yeah. well, um, and on that hey, note... You've got, you've got to go, yeah. Yeah, so, I've got to, I've got to let... go take my daughter to a tennis lesson. <laughs> All right. Good on you, Kino. Thanks for coming on the detour, mate. We'll speak to you soon. Thanks, mate. See ya. Thanks, Matty. Hey, one of the things I want to talk to you about, Gero, is the service course. Now, that's one thing that you're involved with with uh, a former teammate, Christian Meyer. It's a brilliant concept. Um, do you want to give people a bit of an insight into what that was um, in Europe? Well, what that is, so the service course, yeah, as you mentioned, um, Dan, it's a it's a business that, that Christian uh, founded a number of years ago now, and I'm sure you would have been into the shop when you were living in Girona, but the original store being in Girona, there's an image of mm. it uh, now with me at the front. Um, it's a, the concept is being named by the, the service course, it's a very holistic offering in cycling. As in, it is a regular bike shop, customizing like specialising in custom bikes. Um, however, it's your kind of one-stop shop for cycling. As in, they have a, a, a travel sort of business, or we have a travel business, and there's also the, the the cafes attached to it as well. So you can go to the service course, and you can basically be completely looked after. 
there's massage rooms there, there's showers, all that sort of thing. There's rental bikes. So you can go there and be completely looked after with uh, with all your sort of cycling experiences and it has so much that um, that appeal to, to cyclists and, and p- particularly people travelling for cycling. Are you seeing a big boom with the whole um, cyclo tourists, particularly in, in places like Europe? Well, not this year, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> no, well, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, the we've, we've we had the the original store there is in in Girona, which you uh, I assume you would have visited, Dan. But we also have stores now in the UK and in Norway as well, um, and we're sort of looking to expand into into France next year. Um, but the shop and, got, and so, I've got a so website think, as well. Yeah, so yeah I think that's well. is is booming um, across the board. I think through this sort of COVID lockdown, bike sales and by everything associated with cycling has has really skyrocketed with the exception of maybe the travel element of the business. So it is doing exceptionally well um, and there's there's huge interest in the business and the brand. So now that you're moving back to uh, uh, Melbourne, mate, uh, would there be an opportunity for a service course in Melbourne? Well, I think if Melbourne has a lot of a lot of two things, it's, it's good bike shops and good cafes. Um, mm. So I'm not sure the concept would be quite as, as popular um, in Melbourne or, or do quite as well. But in saying that, we have a huge amount, a really large Australian customer base and a lot of people from, from Melbourne and Victoria. So I'm hoping just being on the ground back in Australia again, I'll be able to engage a little bit more with that customer base and, and drive some sales to our to our European stores. So what is the plan for you now uh, that you're back in Australia, mate? What are you, what are you wanting to dig your, uh, your heels into? Well, I'm going to maintain my role with the service course at this stage. Um, hoping to still do a number of trips back to Europe each year when, when sort of the restrictions ease a little bit. But um, I'll be largely working from home and, and really sort of trying to build this uh, build this business. Well, we were talking to Keenan uh, at the top of the show about uh, commentating at the Vuelta. You obviously did the commentary at the Tour de France this year. How did you find that experience and is it something that you want to do a, a bit more of moving forward? I really enjoyed commentating uh, the Tour de France. It was just really great to get back there on the road and, and really follow the racing closely. Um, for sort of 18 months or so when I first stepped away from, from the peloton, I was so busy doing other things that I really didn't have much of an opportunity to, to watch much racing. So it was really good to be back at the Tour de France. Um, I did enjoy the commentary and, yeah, I'd be uh, very keen to sort of continue doing uh, bits and pieces. Um, one of the, the things uh, also a um, few people are, are commenting now. Actually, sorry, I think I've pinched the comment from Gary Tilly then. Was the future hold for Simon Gerrans now that you're moving back to Melbourne? I think we've covered that. Um, Carolyn says bike packaging is huge. Uh, and then, of course, Wendy Superfan. Hi, guys. Good to see Matt on. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of the things we did is interviewed Jai Hindley the other day. Super impressive uh, head on his shoulders. Uh, you must have been pretty proud of these young Aussies coming through the ranks and, and getting these huge results. Yeah, definitely. The Giro was outstanding. But I think you, you looked at the start of the Giro, there were 18 Aussies on the start line for, for stage one. So it was just really good to see there were so many Australians sort of competing in the Giro. And to see um, a young group of guys doing well is doing so well also uh, with Jai, with Ben O'Connor. Um, who'd have thought to have Aussies sort of winning big mountain stages in the third week of, of the Giro and having an Aussie sitting in, in second place um, by the time they got to Milan was was fantastic. And Ben O'Connor, was he was in the break four days in a row because he, he finished second in the stage and he won the stage and he was away again in the break the next day and the day after that. So that's pretty impressive in the third week of a Grand Tour. Oh, that's very impressive, John, and I think you, you know how difficult it is um, to be in breakaways in in the third week of a Grand Tour, there's so much fatigue going into that race, into that into that last week of racing. Um, so to be in that break not once but four times in the final week of the race just shows how big of engine, bigger engine that uh, that Ben O'Connor has. Uh, so it's great to see him get his stage win and and make the move to AG2R for next year. So if he, what's the latest? I saw online um, on Cycling News are saying that the Tour Down Unders probably not going to go ahead um is this going to be a big opportunity particularly at a national level to really showcase the the young crop coming through 
Yeah, uh, I'm sort of stuck here. I've been involved in conversations over the last few days and, and one that just before I joined you guys. I was late myself uh, joining on uh, today, Giro. And so uh, I, I can't really say much, but uh, we will talk in more detail in, in a couple of days when announcements are going to be made. But let's say that, that the summer of cycling in Australia is going to be very different to, to, to the last couple of years. But it's still going to be exciting, and we're still going to have some great, uh, great racing. But it will be very different. But rather than me start rambling away because I'll end up putting my foot in it, um, we will talk in a couple of days. We'll talk. Well, a lot well I'll, re all right, I'll rephrase it, Gero. So, Jai, when we were talking to him, he had a very different path. He went to Europe really early uh, in his career and bypassed that. Particularly as his old man said, "You know, you're going to have to win everything in Australia just to get noticed to get a contract." Um, would you advise younger riders um, to either, if they're really keen, to go to Europe early and sink your teeth into these races or stay in Australia, do the NRS and follow more of a traditional path? I don't know. Well, well what's more of a traditional path these days? Um, I don't know enough about the NRS series at this stage to say that's a great platform or a stepping stone to go to Europe. I definitely think... Although there is a number of riders who recently have sort of gone directly into world tour teams from the NRS, I think they probably struggle when they first hit the world tour, more so than guys who do have some European experience uh, racing maybe under 23 ranks and, and whatnot around Europe first. So um, I don't think it's a be all and end all to get over there, you know, straight out of juniors or anything like that. Um, but if you can get some kind of European experience each year in your career from the junior ranks up until sort of first or second year under 23, uh, before you make a, a full transition to Europe, I think that's probably not a bad approach. But that's exactly mm. how you did, Gero, wasn't it? I mean, you went over, uh, you went a junior, but uh, as an amateur uh, and joined, you know, French and then even a Norwegian team at one stage. Yeah, so it wasn't an easy pathway for me to turn professional. I think I did five seasons in, in Europe uh, racing amateur before um, I got the first shot at, at racing in the professional ranks. Um so, you know, but I was also quite late to the sport. Unlike a guy like Jai, we saw photos of him pretty much, you know, I don't know how old he was, 10 or 12 years old or something on a, on a racing bike. I think he was mm. six, he said. <laughs> he yeah. was six-year-old, he was racing. And he was racing juniors uh, in, in Europe. So uh, he started uh, uh, very young. But we've got some wonderful stories about people like Alan Piper, who just went on his own over as a junior, like you, Gero, um, like Phil. Uh, Phil Anderson, you know, who was 20 or uh, 19, I think, when he first went over there. Um, great stories. But we've also got some wonderful stories about guys who've gone through the NRS, uh, shown stacks of ability with guys like Andrew Christie Johnson, who have nurtured youngsters, Richie Ports and guys like that, and had plenty of contacts and got them into, uh, I I into world teams. So it's worked both ways. Yeah, and most definitely. I don't think there's one there's one cookie cutter mold that that suits everybody. Um, yeah, fortunately for myself, when I was uh, you know I did a little bit of racing in Australia as a junior and and just out of juniors. Uh, but there were a number of pathways to Europe. There was a really good sort of Australian sort of under twenty three program. Um, the the AIS had a number of sort of small uh, European teams where they would place riders as well as a first uh, first taste of of riding abroad, and I'm not sure how many of those are, are currently sort of uh, even in existence now. Mm. Um, Caroline's got a question for you. How many days off the bike does a pro rider have after a three-week tour? Is that a question for me? Uh, that's for you, Gary. Yeah. 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 Well, if, if you would have taken a couple of months. <laughs> uh, yeah, one or two if they're lucky. Um, most guys will just keep it ticking over after a grand tour. There is a lot of fatigue for the first week or so after a grand tour, but um, if you really look after yourself, then you can sort of enjoy some of the best, uh, your best form of the season if you uh, can capitalise on all that work that you, did, that you did throughout three weeks. Yeah, good stuff, mate. Well, um, well, I think it depends on the actual tour and what's on after. I mean, a lot of guys used to go go from the Vuelta and for the Worlds, and that used to be the best preparation uh, for the Worlds, or could have San Sebastian uh, after the the tour and things like that. And and you'd see guys. Yeah, even look at the, the classics this time after the Tour de France. Who were the guys uh, in Liège and, uh, and uh, Drew Flanders flying? It was, it was the Tour de France guys. So they come up no problem at all. Mm, exactly. Well, um, 
Should we have a quick look at the stage profile for the Vuelta well, before well, we let well, Gary go? We'll, we'll do that. But while we've got uh, Gary here, I want, and he said one of the few races he watched was the Tour of Flanders. I would like to get your uh, uh, thoughts on the, the, the Tour of Flanders, Philippe especially, but just the way that all panned out. Not very often when you have three riders with red-hot favourites and they end up just riding away. So what are your thoughts on the, on the um, Ronde von Vlaanderen? Well, unfortunately, I was asleep before that. Yeah, I was going to say, he said he <laughs> fell asleep with 60k to go. <laughs> yeah, uh, you must have watched it since. You must have watched I, the highlights. I, I, missed the best, I missed the best bit of the race. But, um, yeah, the racing has been, um, has been sensational this year. I think we've been, we've been so lucky um, that all the racing has been so good. But, um, yeah, the standout for me this season, obviously, Van Aert, he's been just dominant through the whole season. He's a guy who, who timed his form to perfection. When he came in hot there and won uh, Strada Bianchi, Bianco lays the first race back. We thought, oh, how long is he going to hold this form? And he's still there, you know, duking it out at the Flanders. It was really good to see. Um, but, yeah, some, it, the racing has been great, so aggressive um, and just such a, a new wave of talent coming through this year as well. Yeah, amazing. Mm. Okay, Dan, oh, well, you show the map. <laughs> well, I don't even think it's worth it because Sam Bennett's going to mop him up. It's going to be a sprint. <laughs> like I think I he's paying like a dollar sixty. But I don't know, Gero, whether you've seen any of the highlights of last night. But if you haven't, do yourself a favour. When we hang up, just Google a stage highlights, the world of stage eight, and look at last night. It was one of the best stages, just a, a, a real street fight up the last climb. Yeah, okay. I looked at the results there, um, and I see it sort of turned on its head a little bit in the end. But um, yeah, the guys up there front, um, you know, obviously Carapaz leading on GC lost a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely go and check that out afterwards. It was great. You'll love it. It, it was just one of the best, you know, fights. I mean, the way they were counterattacking, and there was just no holes barred. And then, uh, you know, there's this great ride. And then the last 800 meters, Carapaz attacks. Uh, Roglic, and then it's what happens after that. It's just fantastic. Mm. Well, we knew that Roglic was going to win because George Bennett said, look, his legs are good. He just lost that time because of that bloody jacket. That was all that cost him in the end. So, um, yeah, two yeah. from two. We did pick him. We did pick him, yep. yeah. Oh, well, thanks for coming on the detour, Gero. Good luck with the last two days of your quarantine, mate. You've done well to keep your sanity uh, with – the madhouse in there, but uh, yeah, I'm sure once you get your freedom, mate, it'll be like Andy Dufresne uh, in the last scene of Shawshank. You'll just have the hands in the air, getting showered upon. It'll be awesome. Yeah. It'll be great. Yeah. Okay. Right, mate. Look forward to catching up. Yeah. Good right. stuff, Garo. See Bye. you, mate. All right, if he, it's time to give Mitchell and Wines a plug. You got your script. I have, and I was just talking to them at the Mitchell uh, uh, Winery only just before we, we uh, came on air, um, sorting out everything for uh, for, for Sunday's uh, a birthday party for my uh, young man, Dean's 40th. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're looking forward to uh, the Trevorrow mob arriving, or maybe they're not, but anyway. So, um, yeah, so one of Australia's favourite wineries and a place of escape experience the history, the beauty, and the serenity of the absolutely stunning Goulburn Valley at your own pace. Looking over the vineyards from the iconic tower, staying at the new hotel, relaxing by the pool, recharging in the day spa, exploring the seasonal menu at the Muse, and I will take some really nice photos of Good. the wonderful food that we're going to have there on Sunday, and we'll have them for Sunday night. Um, stopping by the Provador. Uh, touring the cellars and, of course, tasting their signature wines. As I mentioned, it's become a very popular venue for weddings and major functions. And, of course, you can go down to the magnificent art gallery, which is world-class, down in the uh, in, in the basement. And it, it's sensational. Just the, some of the works of art there are amazing. And there it is, the $10,000. Oh, there's my phone ringing. <laughs> And I'll phone call like, silence for podcast, please. I, I should have. And it's it's Andrew Moore from Lexus, so I should take it because uh, I've been wanting to talk to him for ages. But anyway, I'll talk to you in a minute. Um, well, but, you can take the call. I'll wrap the no, show up. No, 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 no. I no, no. it on but my own. I wanted to talk about the, the, the land cruiser. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the $10,000 land cruiser with a million-dollar paint million job. Million-dollar paint job. That's got a better <laughs> ring to it. <laughs> uh, very good, mate. Well, uh, that was a hectic show. I think it rattled me. 
throwing going solo at the start. It's fried me. I don't think I've, I've quite been on edge because this thing goes you, live. You did, you did it to me. You did it to me at the end of the show. You oh, left me mate. alone and live. Yeah, well, you only had to do it for 30 seconds. I was trying to steer the ship for about two minutes and we hit anchor. Buddy. Yeah, I'm going to need a stiff drink after this, I think. But, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I think tomorrow we're going to have Zach Dempster on. Uh, that's going to be a great chat. He's uh, a f- former Aussie uh, pro cyclist that he's now a DS with Israel Start Nation. Uh, so he's at the Vuelta at the moment. Uh, loves a chat. So we'll talk about his career. Uh, have yep. a good yarn. Yep. And, uh, yeah, really looking forward to that. So we'll be back at normal time, 7.30 Australian Standard Time tomorrow. See you then.